and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with Dotsie Bausch. And today we have a friend of both of ours on. And I'm excited because she is a woman with whom I connect as an activist on three levels, which is unusual. Um, she's an animal rights activist. She's an electric car advocate. <laughs> and um, she's a population person. She understands the. She, she just totally jives with me on being concerned about how many people are on the planet. And so... I right. just felt like I met my soul sister. When I we met might have Leilani. to dive into some population stuff with you guys today because you are listening to a podcast right now with three mo- women who have chosen not to populate. That's right. So That's right. I, I think actually... that I want to dive into that. Yeah. I love your all's work in that area. Thank you, Dati. So let me tell everybody a little bit more about her and who it is. <laughs> if they haven't already guessed. Uh, our guest today is Leilani Munter. And she is a biology graduate from UC San Diego, turned race car driver and environmental activist, like you mentioned. She believes it is essential for humans to adapt and evolve the way we are living to a sustainable way that does not destroy the world around us. Leilani is an advocate for renewable energy, solar power, electric cars, plant-based diets, and animal rights. She sits on the board of three nonprofits, the Oceanic Preservation Society, Empowered by Light, and Earth X Film. Leilani is also an ambassador for Rick O'Berry's Dolphin Project and a patron of Population Matters. And Leilani was featured in the 2015 Emmy-nominated documentary film Racing Extinction with, whew, if you haven't seen it, absolutely, absolutely see that. Leilani wants our future to be a both cleaner and kinder world. And watch out, folks, because Leilani is also fiercely convincing. So turn off this podcast immediately if you're not ready to make changes in your daily lives to protect our precious planet. I was convinced personally uh, by Leilani after about a 10-minute personal dissertation she gave to me last August uh, at our Switch for Good Athlete Summit on the magic and beauty of experiencing a total eclipse. So much so that I literally went straight from her convincing argument and booked my trip to Chile (laughs) to join Leilani, (laughs) her husband, and her best friend to view the total eclipse that happened just a few months ago uh, in Chile. And she was right. It was one of the most magical experiences of my life. So be ready (laughs) to be convinced by Leilani (laughs) Mutcher. Hi, Leilani. Hi. Hi. (laughs) So good to see you both. Uh, you too. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, gosh, there's so there's, much. There's so much. We, we, I think we'll, go go. Can we start about just your your race car driving career? Because I know you just, you retired this year, but you were a real pioneer in this area. And I don't know a lot about race car driving. And I understand from my research on you that you drove both um, stock car and Indy car. And I keep saying NASCAR, but NASCAR is actually a division of stock car, right? So tell us a little bit about race car driving and one on one. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I spent most of my career in stock cars, which is the more popular form of motorsport in the U.S. Um, the other form is open wheel racing, which you guys will. Um, recognize when the Indy 500 is on. Those are the cars where it looks like, you know, sort of like a little cockpit with wheels that are open and have no fenders. Um, So I drove a little bit of that in 2007, but most of my career has been in the stock cars. And I've really um, found a way to use my race cars to talk about these issues that I care about. So, you know, renewable energy and veganism and solar power and electric cars and bring that to the NASCAR community and the racing community, you know, which tends to not maybe have a lot of these messages and not have a lot of vegan food offered at at the um, racetracks. And uh, yeah, so it was definitely, I was the odd one out, not just, you know, being a female driver, you're automatically sort of the odd one out in the garage because it's mostly male drivers in our sport. Um, but mostly. then in addition to wait, that- Wait, wait, mostly, no, it's all male drivers except for maybe, maybe often just you in a race, right? Or you and one other woman. And the only other female race car driver I know is Danica Patrick and you, those are the only two. He- 
Yeah, How many there are, are there? a couple of other girls um, coming up through the stock car racing ranks. And, I, you know, I have to admit, since I retired after Daytona, I haven't been watching a whole lot of it. Um, well, actually, I haven't been watching it at all. Um, <laughs> can well, you've been that. too busy trying to save the world, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, for me, I was really passionate about racing in the very beginning of my career. I started racing in 2001. Um, but... I really, it, it became more of a tool for me to, to highlight my activism and to get my activism in front of a large number of people. And so the passion that I had for the actual sport um, started to fade away. And I, I think I hung in there for a little bit longer um, than maybe my passion would have carried me, but because I knew this is an amazing way for me to reach these audiences. And, you know, last year I ran a race car that was um, the vegan strong car. And we were all about trying to get people that, that eat um, meat and dairy products to, to taste vegan food. And over five race weekends last year, uh, we gave away 30,000 impossible burgers to race fans. And we had, you know, it all decked out, right? We had the follow your heart cheese. We had Miyoko's butter on the toasted bun and lettuce and tomato. Um, and then we did the follow your heart Thousand Island dressing. So it was, you know, a really great little sample of the burger. And it was a huge hit. I mean, we could not make the burgers fast enough. There was constantly a line of race fans waiting. And then as soon as we'd bring a tray of the burgers out, they would be gone and there'd be people standing there still waiting to get them. So um, it was a really, really positive response. And um, I think that's the best way for you to change the world, you know, is you really have to reach out to the people that don't agree with you. Because if you're just, you know, running around talking to other vegans or talking to other electric car advocates, then you're not actually changing the crowd that needs to learn the most. Mm -hmm. um, so racing sort of allowed me, you know, that opportunity to reach these millions and millions of people who, you know, maybe hadn't seen an electric car before or hadn't tried a vegan hamburger before. Real quick, you just told us a great story um, in Chile about getting into racing when you were younger and you were faster, I think, than the teacher. You just have to tell people that story because it's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I like to jump out of airplanes and I like to do stuff that, you know, gets my blood pumping and makes you feel alive. And I always find that things that are either to do with speed or heights are things <laughs> that um, get my blood going. And uh, so when I was um, studying biology at UC San Diego, I um, I had made a bucket list of things that I wanted to do. And one of those things that I was always getting in trouble for was speeding. Uh, so I thought I should save up some money and go to a racing school and see, you know, what is it like to actually be able to drive a car at whatever its limit is without any worry of getting in trouble and getting pulled over and getting a traffic ticket. And so I saved up my money and I went to the racing school in 2000 and quickly um, realized that this was something that I really had a knack for. There was a local race team owner that happened to be at the track that day and came over to talk to me and, and asked me actually, what are you, who are you here with, he said. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm here by myself. I saved up all my money to come here. And he was like, well, that's pretty unusual. Usually when women are here, you know, they've been kind of dragged by their husbands or their boyfriends and they don't even really want to be here. And I think there were like 30 or 40 drivers and I was the only woman. And uh, so he said that was a surprising thing. But then he also told me that I was the fastest car on the track and that he would really encourage me to to chase my you know, ambition if I had any desire to actually become a race car driver. And to which I replied, you know, I don't have the kind of money that it takes to drive race cars on the weekends. Um, <laughs> but then he encouraged me and said, you know, actually, there's very few women in our sport. So just by you being a female, it makes you have a really different story. And so even though you don't have any personal funding to race, um, you may be able to find sponsors. And so I started looking for sponsors just to run on the local short tracks. Like it was a little like three eighths mile asphalt track in San Diego, um, little Saturday night short track racing. And it took me nine months to find my first sponsor. I heard a lot of no's. 
<laughs> and I had a lot of doors slam in my face. Um, but I heard my first yes, and I went to my first race, and I fought for the lead in my first race and just had a blast and really um, got welcomed into the sport after that. People came over, some of the other drivers, and shook my hand and said, you know, I was a little bit skeptical of you when you showed up, but, you know, that was the most fun I've had racing in a long time. You really gave me a run for my money, and we're glad to have you. And mm -hmm. that was the moment that I just went, okay, this is, I really want to do this. And so then the following year in 2002, I picked up and I moved out here to North Carolina, um, which is the epicenter of NASCAR racing. So, you know, if you want to be an actor, you move to LA, you want to be a country music singer, you move to Nashville, you want to be a race car driver in NASCAR, you move to Charlotte. So that's what I did. And I've been here ever since and had 18 years of just so many adventures. Um, and I loved it. Um, but I'm ready to move on and, and really concentrating on just being an activist and making documentary films now. Well, what a force. I did mean, you know that story? No, I it's didn't. Great, it's right? a great story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, Leilani. Were you a vegan then when you started uh, your journey? When did you become vegan? No, vegetarian. I oh. went vegan in 2011. I actually celebrate my vegan birthday every year. <laughs> I think I actually make a bigger deal about my vegan birthday than I do my regular uh. birthday because it actually means more to me because it was a day you know, that I made the decision that I was going to live by what I believed in and really, truly live my ethics all day long. And um, so it means more to me. Every single year I go get like a vegan cupcake or <laughs> sometimes I'll try and bake, you know, my own dessert, which doesn't always go what well. Day, what that. day is it? Mine's October 10th, 2010. So. Mine is June. Ooh, I have to look it up. June 10th, I think oh, it is. June 10th. Hang on. Nice. Let me, nice. let me, let me make sure I'm saying that right. I don't want to give you the wrong date. We want all the fans to give I'm you happy birthday go, wishes. In, uh, I'm starting to go see now. Yep. Oh, no, sorry. Not June 10th. July 10th. July 10th. Cool. So, yeah. So I always make a big deal about it. And I always do a little post and talk about how eight years vegan. I'm still alive. I haven't died of protein deficiency. I have not been stranded on a desert island. Well, the reason I asked that actually is because I heard a vegan race car driver, and I've forgotten his name, but you might know him, um, speak about the intense physical challenge it is to drive a With car. And I don't know if he was an IndyCar racer or a NASCAR racer or what the difference is. You can tell us, but I wondered how, if being vegan changed you as a driver at all, and can you tell us a little bit about the experience in those cars during these races that can last a long time? Mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder it, how you pee. I just want to know. And I read that, like, <laughs> I actually looked up, like, the average, <laughs> the average rate, you know, the, lot of the races can last, like, three hours, and what, you yeah. don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, I was not on the very top level of the sport, so I wasn't doing 500, 600-mile races. My races tended to be around 200 miles. Okay, um, just 200. So <laughs> a little bit shorter, and actually, I've never had to pee in the race car because you're sweating so much. That was one of the things I was going to talk about, about the you know, the physical demands on you. One of the biggest demands is the heat. Um, so not so much in an open wheel car, but in the stock cars, you know, those cars are built to not have any drag. You don't want to have any air coming into the car because if you do, that's gonna slow the race car down. So the whole point is to have the race car sort of slipping through the air as fast as possible. And that would mean that there's no outside air getting into the cockpit. And then on top of that, I'm wearing like a three layer Nomex suit that's fireproof. And then I've got a helmet over my head and it's just you, it can get up to be 150 degrees inside the car. Um, wow. So it's one of the things that I would do when I was racing to prepare is I would do a lot of hot yoga because I needed to get used to being in extreme heat to where I was sweating profusely. And, you know, you can sometimes get overwhelmed by that heat. And I remember racing in like 2006, 2007, 
Um, I didn't have the uh, ability to have an air conditioning unit. So you can get an air conditioning unit that blows cold air into your helmet. Mm -hmm. They're really, really expensive. And most drivers, you know, can't afford those when they're working their way up the ladder. Um, thankfully, when I got to the higher levels later in my career, I had a team owner who had an extra spare. And so he let me borrow them for my races. I never had to purchase my own, but I never owned one. Um, but it can get so, so hot in there. So you really have to focus on being able to get through that kind of heat that you would normally feel like you want to collapse in and just be a hundred percent focused and concentrating. Cause you know, we're going 200 miles an hour. We're inches away from other cars that are in front of us, behind us, to the sides of us. You really have to be focused on hitting your marks and not making any mistakes and you can't lose focus for a second. So that was something that I really found difficult when I was you know, in the lower levels and I wasn't yet um, conditioned to do that. I think definitely when I went vegan in 2011, I just noticed my body was just stronger. I, I didn't get sick. I didn't even get a cold for six and a half years after I went vegan. So I used to, when I was vegetarian, I would probably get a cold at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. I just thought it was normal. Like when my friends and family got sick and I was around people that were sick, I just assumed I was going to get ill. And six and a half years, I made it without a single cold. And now I've had a total of two colds in eight years. And both of them have been very, very minor where it's just, you know, a couple of days and it's gone pretty quickly. So I've been um, I've been really surprised at that sort of side benefit, especially because, you know, I'll admit I'm a little bit of a, a I'm a healthy vegan, but I'm also a junk food vegan. I like, <laughs> you know, the vegan pizza and the vegan burgers and vegan mac and cheese and vegan ice cream and vegan burritos, all that stuff that's, you know, not necessarily as a vegan, the healthiest options, but I enjoy them. So I'd say I'm, I'm about 50 50 between the two. I'm with you on that one. So July 10th, 2011, what what happened? Why did you go vegan? I think I just started to learn more. You know, I was really into watching documentaries. I had um, sort of fallen down the documentary rabbit hole when I saw The Cove. Um, so The Cove came out and won the Academy Award in 2010. And I think once I fell down that rabbit hole, I just became obsessed with watching documentaries. In fact, that's still most of what I watch on television. And I started to see a lot more documentaries. You know, I think I've watched Earthlings and, you know, Food Inc. and Forks Over Knives and all of those docs that, you know, came at it from different different issues, right? There's so many reasons to be vegan. You can focus on the health issue. You can focus on the environmental issue. You can focus on the animal rights and the cruelty that, that these factory farms induce on these innocent creatures. And for me, the, the reason for doing it and the thing that really got to my heart was the animals. And the planet was, you know, also something that I care a lot about. So those were my main reasons. And that's why I don't consider myself to be, you know, a vegan for my health. I feel like health is a nice side benefit and I've definitely benefited from it. Um, but it's not my reasoning for being vegan. Um, so I have also learned over the years as I've tried to convince family and friends to go vegan I would share these documentaries and I would share all these facts. And oftentimes I would talk about the things that I cared about, right? So I'd talk about the animals, talk about the planet. And I wouldn't really bring up health that much because that wasn't one of my main reasons for doing it. Um, and then one of my friends who I couldn't convince with the animal rights, couldn't convince it with the environment, he saw forks over knives and went vegan. And so then I immediately was like, oh, I'm, lo I'm leaving something important out of my mm -hmm. arsenal and I need to present all the arguments because you don't know what's going to stick with each individual person. So you really have to talk about all of them and one of them will hopefully resonate with that person. But I was making the mistake for many years of just talking about my reasoning and not talking about the others. And that was a mistake and I've, I've learned to correct that for sure. Well, mm -hmm. I would think that you, that, it, being a what you you call yourself a hippie chick, and you're in a in a 
you were in an industry for 18 years that wasn't about hippies at all, people thought, right? <laughs> race car fans, 75 yeah. million race, racing fans uh, in America. Um, I remember that my sister was one of the first female firefighters in the San Francisco Fire mm -hmm. Departments. Um, so there were uh, 15 women and 1,500 uh, men in the fire department. And she mm -hmm. thought that the most pushback she would get was because she was a woman. And actually, it was because she was a vegetarian. That was mm -hmm. more, and that she uh, went to Stanford. That was also hmm. an issue, because I think there was an elitist thing there. Um, yeah. Or, what, what was it, wh when you were in the race car industry, you said that the men seemed to accept you as a woman, but how did they accept your vegetarian mm -hmm. and then v your veganism in 2011? And, and the fans, too, from, they're from a totally different culture. How did you speak to them? Yeah, so there was actually a lot of pushback. There was one particular driver that came up to me after my first race. He was the guy that I was battling for the lead mm -hmm. with for Mills to the race. He was the one that came over to shake my hand and let me know that he had gained respect for me in the race. Um, but I did definitely got a lot of haters and people that just didn't believe that women should be out there, you know, because there were so few women. Um, and that was coming from race fans. It was coming from people within the industry. Um, I wanted to fit in. I think it's human nature that you sort of want to be accepted by your peers. And I remember when I first moved here and I was vegetarian, trying to not advertise that I was vegetarian, like, you know, I'd be at a barbecue and I'd just be eating like the corn and the coleslaw. And then people would notice and say like, how come you aren't having any hot dogs or whatever the meat was? And then I'd kind of, you know, quietly say, oh, I'm, I'm vegetarian, you know, <laughs> and then they'd start making fun of me immediately and say, oh, that's, that must be why you're so short. You probably stunted your growth <laughs> as a child because you weren't getting enough protein. Like I was trying to be accepted by the racing community for a long time. And, um, the turning point for me was actually in 2006 when an inconvenient truth came out. And I remember going to see that movie in the theater and it, was a real epiphany for me that, you know, it wasn't enough for me to talk about climate change and all of the things that we are doing to the planet to just my family and friends in private. That was the moment where I walked out of the theater and looked at, at the time, who was my boyfriend and later became my husband. Um, it's not enough. Like, I have to do more. I want to start using the car to talk about these things. And there was a lot of pushback, but that was the moment where I think I kind of just let go of trying to be accepted. Somewhere in my heart, I realized I'm never going to be accepted. I'm vegetarian. I'm a woman. I come from a science background. I'm just so different from so many of these people in my industry that me trying to be accepted by them is just a waste of my time because even if they you know, may try to accept me. I mean, behind my back, they're probably making fun of me eating rabbit food or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was the year where I just said, you know what, screw it. And I started a whole section on my website that was dedicated to environmental news. And that was when I realized my purpose was, was maybe to be a bridge between these two worlds. And I had kind of this magical moment where I saw I, I saw my website was getting a lot of traffic from a NASCAR forum. And so out of curiosity, I went to the forum to see, like, why were so many people coming over? And it was actually somebody that was really upset at me for promoting an inconvenient truth on my website. I mm. was saying it was a movie that I thought everybody should see. And they were calling me all kinds of names and saying I was brainwashed by Al Gore <laughs> and um, all these other people were chiming in to agree that, you know, I was stupid or whatever. And but the thread was really long by the time I got there. And somebody finally posted, have you actually seen this film? Because it's a little weird for you to be so angry with this driver if you haven't even actually seen the film that she's talking about. And then the conversation sort of shifted from talking badly about me to talking about climate change and whether or not climate change was real. And by the time I got to the end of the thread, people were posting graphs of the parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. 
And this is on a mm -hmm. NASCAR forum where normally they are just talking about what's going on at the NASCAR races. So that was the moment where like the hair kind of stood up on the back of my neck and I realized it all finally made sense to me because when I got a degree in biology and graduated and then told my friends and family that I was moving to North Carolina to become a NASCAR <laughs> driver, they all thought I had lost my mind and I don't blame them. Um, but that was the moment where I realized, ah, this is why I came on this weird path. I can start talking now to these race fans about the issues that I really think are the most important and I can reach this demographic of people that, you know, most people that work in the environmental world or the vegan world are not reaching them because they're not in their community. So I straddled, you know, from 2007, 2006, 2007 to 2019, sort of living in these two very different worlds. Um, and seeing both sides and realizing there's actually a lot more crossover between those two worlds than people mm -hmm. give them credit for. So I would meet, you know, people that were at clean energy events and talking about solar power and they were secret, secretly race fans that watched all the NASCAR races and were coming over to talk to me about racing. And I'd also be at the NASCAR races and have people come run up to me and talk about renewable energy and electric cars and all that. So I think we tend to put people in boxes and it's easy to categorize people like that. Um, but having lived in two very different boxes for many years, um, I can see that that we all fit into many boxes a lot more often than than we think. Yeah. In the I, I'm wondering in regards to the environment, in regards to planetary responsibility, um, in speaking to, let's just say, a tough crowd, whether it was a NASCAR crowd or any other um, speaking events that you've done, what are the top two or three pieces of information, factoids even, that people really seem to hear you and resonate with them? There's so many different facts out there about what we're doing to the environment. And, and quite frankly, some of them for me, I'm just, they just go whoosh, like, okay, that's terrible. What do I do about that? How do you really get people to connect with what's happening to our planet? I, I think the ones that I like to focus on is um, endangered species. And maybe that's from working on racing extinction where, you know, I was projecting imagery of sometimes the last of their species onto the sides of buildings. Um, so we did these very large scale projections on the Empire State Building, the United Nations, of all the animals that we're losing. And I think, you know, the, the photographer that took those pictures, his name's Joel Sartori, and he has something that he calls the photo arc. He is trying to photograph every captive animal in the world and sort of he talks about it in the film, how he wants to make us look that animal in the face and one, recognize its beauty, but two, realize that we're driving them to extinction. So right now we're living through the Anthropocene extinction, which we're driving animals to a rate of extinction that's about a thousand times faster than the natural background rate. And I think when people realize we're losing all these really amazing creatures, you know, that is something that emotionally gets at people. And science shows, data shows that humans actually don't usually change their behaviors based on facts mm -hmm. or science or data they change their behaviors based on emotions. And so highlighting those animals, I think, is a good one. I've also, as Alexandra talked about earlier, I like to talk about population, which is certainly a very emotional issue. It, it is volatile at times. You know, people can get very defensive and upset about even bringing up this issue. Um, but like her, I believe that every single conversation we have, every single time we talk about population, we're normalizing it and saying, this is a subject that we can't keep sweeping under the rug. We have to start talking about it. If we're going to be, you know, marching in the streets about climate change and ocean acidification and habitat destruction and loss of the rainforest. I mean, the Amazon rainforest is on fire right now. Um, we, we have to address the core reason behind all of this other environmental destruction, all these 
are they're basically symptoms, mm -hmm. but they're symptoms of there being so many people that are using so many resources that we are using more than the earth can replenish and we're throwing off the balance that's been there for, you know, billions of years. So it took humans 200,000 years to reach our first billion people. And then it only took like 130 years for us to reach our second billion, then 60 to reach our third. Um, then I think it was 14 years to reach our fourth billion, which actually happened in the year that I was born, 1974 is when we hit 4 billion. And so that means I'm 45 years old. That means in just my lifetime, we have almost doubled the human population. We are approaching 8 billion people now. We're at 7.7 .7 billion. And we're currently adding humans to the planet at a rate that's about a million people net growth every four and a half days, which translates to a billion every 12 years. And right now with our current rate of, of meat consumption, for every, every billion people we add to the planet, we're adding 10 billion farm animals. And we already know, you know, we're using one third of the arable land on the planet to grow food that's just going straight to, to feed livestock. I mean, it's just so unsustainable the way that we're living. And I do feel like there's something happening. I feel like we're waking up and we're starting to realize we have to change the way that we're living. My concern is I get so happy when I see an electric car or I see a solar array on someone's house or I hear somebody ordering something vegan. <laughs> but And those things are all great. And, and these individual behaviors are so important. But my worry is that we're adding so many people to the planet on such a fast rate that there's not enough electric cars being rolled out to humanity, not enough solar panels, not enough vegans to make up for the sheer numbers of people that we're adding. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, it's like we've got a house that's flooding, right? It's like somebody left the tap on somewhere and the house is flooding. And so we're taking out mops and buckets and we're cleaning it up, but we're just leaving the tap on, which is, this continuous addition of a billion more people on this finite planet every 12 years. And so I really feel like we have to look at that core driving force behind all of these other environmental problems. And that's population. Rick O'Berry commented on one of my population posts and said, population is the granddaddy of them all. This is the issue that's causing all of these other ones. But it seems like people are so afraid to talk about it. I mean, there's very few environmental organizations that will touch it just because it is so such a hot button emotional issue that they'd just rather leave it alone and focus on talking about the rainforest or ocean acidification. But we, we, we're we running out of time. I feel like we really need to address the, the elephant in the room. I've heard Alexandra say... Um, we can still have happy families, just small happy families instead of large happy families. Mm -hmm. Is What do you guys find when you guys are speaking on this topic? Um, what's the way in? What do people react to in a more positive way? I, can, I, can, I think all of us can guess how they might be reacting in a, in a negative way at times. But w where do you see the light bulb go on? Where do you see people start to sort of shift their mind sphere to... I hear what they're saying and this is this is real and how can I take a step towards changing and lessening the population? Leilani? Do you I I feel like I want to hear what you have to say Alexandra on this one. Well, I know that what I try and do is make it very neutral and unemotional by I you've and Leilani and I've been on several panels right. together so she knows my spiel and a lot of it is with facts and these are numbers and this is a numbers game and <clears throat> this is about everybody on the planet having smaller families, one child families um and not through coercion and uh through through our culture changing and understanding the benefits of having a one child family because for so long our culture and our biology we've been inculcated with this idea because every population every species on the earth has been uh, programmed to re procreate to survive that now we have to change our mindset mm. 
to, to understand that we can't procreate like we've been procreating if we want to survive. Mm -hmm. And that is a very hard thing to do, but it can be done, and it's being done all over the world because our family sizes have actually been cut in half in the last 60 years. So since 19, in the 1960s, the average number of kids per couple was five around the world, and now it's 2.5. That is still too big, but this shows that we can change. Because we're still growing at a billion people every 12 years. Exactly, so it's like, exactly. Okay. We're, we're actually growing faster than in the 60s because there's so many more people more having babies. Right. right, right, right. Yeah. So I try I mean, and get at a very, at a very logical math point of view saying, this is just math. And also, I also point out that I don't have kids. I'm not paid by anybody. My siblings also made the same choice not to have kids for the same reasons. I don't have skin in this game for much longer. So my agenda is for your kids. Right. And your your generations. And so if, don't look at me as the bad guy. I have nothing. Right, Leilani? That's the same as, as you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to always point that out that, um, you know, because I don't have any kids, I'm not going to have any grandkids. I, I'm not making a world better for like my relatives because I don't have any <laughs> kids breeding. But we are making the world better by making these choices to not procreate. We're making the world better for future generations. So the people who have had children they're gonna have a less crowded, cleaner, happier world where there's more resources and less people because of people like me and Alexander making the decision to not have children. And, Dotsie. and for me, and Dotsie, sorry. <laughs> um, for me, I made this decision when I was in college. I actually went to a biochemistry class and my professor just told me, told the whole class, close your books, we're not talking about biochemistry today. I'm going to show you a film. And the film was about population. And I just remember being absolutely floored and shocked by what I was seeing. I was probably like 21. And I had never thought about population in my whole life. And it was the first, it was like this moment where there was this huge thing to be worried about that I didn't know existed for 21 years. And then all of a sudden, there it was, like, in my face, on my lap. And I walked all the way across the campus with my professor talking about it. And I knew on that very day, by the time that class was over, I was not going to have children. And so I've been quietly worried about population for, you know, that was over 20 years ago, 24 years ago. But I never spoke up about it because I found that people got so defensive and angry when I would that I just kind of got scared of talking about it. And I didn't start becoming vocal about it publicly until like three years ago. And now what I do is whenever I'm having a conversation with a stranger and I'll find that probably the first or second question that people ask me being my age in my 40s is, do you have kids? It's, it's usually like the first or second mm -hmm. question. And so now I've changed how I answer that. I used to say no. Now I say, no, my, my husband and I are child free by choice. And by adding those two little words at the end of the sentence by choice, that opens up this opportunity to have a conversation because then they know that I'm not child free because I wanted to have kids, but I couldn't have them. Right, right. They know that it was like a conscious choice. And so then they usually become curious and they say, oh, that's interesting. Why? And then I'll tell them the story about my professor and the environmental impact and how many resource we're, resources we're using so quickly. And I've had even people that have lots of kids say, you know what? I wasn't thinking about this. I have five kids, but I am definitely going to sit down my kids and talk to them about how many kids they have, because it is right. We do need to be talking about it. And I don't want parents to feel like they can't be a part of this discussion. You know, I feel like maybe sometimes that is where the defensiveness is coming. Is sure. They're saying, well, I already had kids, so I can't do anything about that. And I feel like you're criticizing me because I had four kids. And that can't be the intention. They have to understand that, you know, this is a problem we're all facing together. And certainly, you know, I didn't think about population for many years and then my eyes opened up and I'm sure there's lots of people who had kids and then later thought, 
oh my gosh, (laughs) there's too many people on the planet. I probably shouldn't have had five kids, but it's too late. But it's not too late for them to then have a conversation with with their kids and their grandkids about it. Um, So I just feel like we need to make everybody feel welcome at the table. There shouldn't be you know, fighting about who can and cannot be a part of the movement. I feel like the vegan movement right now is having a real, um, I feel like it's a real tough time right now because there's so much infighting. Um, I have been in, you know, big arguments with people on, um, on Facebook and on social media because I, you know, gave away the impossible burger and just this, this, fighting with each other we, we why were really people upset about the saw in, that why, why were people upset about you giving away the impossible burger and 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 it's, educating 30,000 more than 30,000 people about how delicious vegan food can be and that you can get it at burger king <laughs> right i know how amazing uh, is I mean, that that yeah. we can get a vegan burger at burger in king I mean, we actually went on the very first day that it rolled out nationally we went to Burger King, sat down. I mean, I hadn't been in that place right. in years, <laughs> at least eight years. And every single order that was coming through the drive through and that were people walking in were ordering the Impossible Burger. I had the exact same, or the Impossible Whopper, had the exact same experience at Del Taco in Arizona when I went to get the Beyond Meat tacos. Same thing. And when I went through the drive through I asked what is the percentage of orders that you're taking for a regular Whopper versus Mm -hmm. impossible Whopper? Like, is it 50, 50? And the guy said, no, I would estimate that about 75% of the orders are for the impossible Whopper. So this is a huge, you know, step for veganism. I mean, this is mainstream. This is everywhere. I don't know how many Burger Kings there are in the world, but it's a good thing. But a lot of vegans um, are upset because Impossible Burger or Impossible Foods did for FDA testing, did testing on, I think, 188 rats Mm -hmm. in order to get that special letter, which is like the no questions asked letter for, you know, that some restaurant chains ask for before they do like yeah. national distribution. So Impossible CEO, you know, wrote a, a big post on their website about why he made the agonizing decision to do this rat testing in order to get this special clearance from the FDA for mass distribution. And so there were all kinds of vegans attacking me, calling me all kinds of names and, you know, all, all over this impossible whopper. And, you know, I think we have to see the forest for the trees. And I think you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Am I bummed that 188 rats died for the impossible whopper to be out there? Yes. But they are gone and they can now save millions and millions and millions of cows because now it has that stamp that says that, you know, plant-based heme is safe for human consumption and they have that. I mean, I don't understand all the details of it, but they have that special clearance. And so, yes, I would rather they didn't do the animal testing, but the fact of the matter is that's done and it's already happened and the product is going to save millions and millions of animals. So I'm supportive of it. Same thing as I was when Ben and Jerry's came out with vegan ice cream. You know, I was so excited to see such a big major brand offering vegan flavors. And there were some people I remember when I posted and I was so excited about having vegan Ben and Jerry's that were mad because they still make, you know, other products that are not vegan. But if you look at the effect that these big brands can have on how many people will try their products that are not vegans, it's huge. I mean, they can change so many people to like opening up to our movement. So I look at it as, you know, you can't demand perfection. You have to you have to not let perfection become the enemy of the good. And you have to try and see the forest for the trees and see the big picture that overall millions of animals will be saved, even though those 188 rats were sacrificed for it. Well, that's your, that's your forte is bridging that those two um, communities Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. what takes time. 
it takes time for us to become perfect, <laughs> and hopefully we're going to get there. Um, I, w- I want to talk a little bit about some of the extraordinary things that you did as, a, as an environmentalist with your race car driving, because as a race car driver, you recognized the carbon output of uh, driving a race car. So you were the first driver to offset every single race with um, uh, you, you bought rainforest. Is that land in the rainforest? Mm-hmm. Can you yep. tell our listeners about that, and also about the solar pit you you had too, completely solar pit? Yes, yes. So um, in 2007, when I was in the open wheel cars, was when I made that commitment to adopt and protect an acre of rainforest every time I drove the car. And you know that was to recognize that there was nothing that I could do about this fuel that I was burning and the only way I could make up for that was to protect something else. And uh, so last year I kind of stepped it up. I did eight races last year, but I did protect um, 1,500 acres of rainforest with the Rainforest Trust. And I'm hoping at some point to go down to the rainforest and see it because I've never mm-hmm. actually been able to make a trip down there. Um, did you and ever, then, uh, just a question about that, did you ever race an electric car? Because I know electric cars can hold their own on shorter distances and beat a gas car. Did you ever consider racing one? Only on the street in my personal Oh, car. with you in your Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> with all the no, speeding tickets. She also, she also drove to all her races in her Tesla. So she was carbon free when she was going to her races, right? Yeah, so I got my Tesla in 2013, and then I started to drive to all the races. And then I would tell the fans, you know, the supercharger stops that I was going to be at so that they could, if they were curious about the Tesla, Mm. they could come and meet me and chat with me, and I could give them a tour of the car um, while my car was charging. And oftentimes when I'd get to the racetrack, it was so funny because here you're at this racetrack with all these amazing race cars, right? And so many of the fans would come up to me at autograph sessions and ask to s- if my Tesla was here and could they see it to the point That's where I actually cool. started to pull the Tesla around to some of the autograph sessions when I could and park it kind of at the end of the autograph session so that after the autograph session was over, we'd go over and I'd just be giving tours of the Tesla and answering all kinds of questions. Um, because race fans, you know, obviously they like cars, yeah. they follow car racing. And the thing about the Tesla that I love is, it's got all those things that I want as a race car driver, right? It's it's fast, it's fun to drive, it's sexy looking, it's cool. You know, if I had showed up with a, another electric car that wasn't didn't have the cool factor, I don't know if it would have had as much love as the race fans had for the for the Tesla. And then the other thing that I did is in 2014, my um, I put up solar panels on the roof of my house. So then my house and my garage became solar powered, and thus the cars. And then we took that one step further where we got a portable solar device where we could um, sort of unfold solar panels at the racetrack and then it had battery storage. And we were able to power my pit box on pit road um, all using solar power. And the interesting thing that happened was so many of the other race teams were interested in finding out about buying this system, not because they wanted to be green or reduce their carbon footprint or anything like that, but because they heard how quiet it was in my pit because we didn't have this big diesel generator making all this loud noise. You've already got these loud race cars. And then on top of that, you've got this diesel generator. And so when the pit crew is trying to talk to the crew chief and they are having trouble hearing each other, they're having to yell that kind of went away in my pit because it was totally silent. And so they looked at it as like actually a competitive advantage um, for the racing, not so much the environmental impact. And unfortunately, there's no electric stock cars out there just yet. Um, Mm. I wish there was. um, But Yeah, you might go back into racing, I think. (laughs) (laughs) For 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 now, I'll just race people off the line when they happen to pull up next to my Tesla at a stoplight. I hear you, sister. (laughs) Uh, so you've retired from racing, but you've said, I'm not slowing down just because I'm not in a fast car. Yeah. What What's next for you? I also think, you know, I'm 45 years old. My body couldn't recover from hits. You know, I had like a 190 mile an hour crash in at Pocono where a car came full speed into my rear end. And, you know, I felt it for quite a few days after, whereas in my 20s, I feel like 
I could bounce back after a couple mm. days and feel normal again. And, you know, fact of the matter is I'm 45 and, you know, my body can't take any more of those or I, I don't want my body to have to take any yeah. more of those. So I was also just physically, you know, ready to step back from putting myself in that kind of danger of really injuring myself. And I was lucky. I never had any really serious injuries. I had carbon monoxide poisoning once. Um, but I never broke any bones in the race car. I had some big crashes and I, I do have a partially herniated disc in my lower back. Um, but that's and you it. Also so had I a got lot away of with a lot. Very impressive finishes. So thank you for that. Truly. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much yes. for being on our We show. love you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys too. You are both so amazing. My vegan sisters. <laughs> So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>